With me, Dr. Y.B. Reddy, the former governor of the RBI and the author of the latest book out on block economic policies and India's reform agenda, The New Thinking. Uh, the author is right here. Congratulations on your new book, sir. Now, my question first is, why do you think the world needs new thinking, and especially India? Let me put it first. After the global crisis, I think all over the world, there is a debate. One, and is there, is there been a failure of economics? You know the famous inquiry uh, from the Queen of England. Right. Why did no, anybody expect in the school, London School of Economics? Anyway, there's a lot of discussion going on. In fact, there is an institute of new economic thinking with an advisory board consisting of half a dozen Nobel Prize winners in economics. Mm. So there is a lot of new thinking going on in the discipline. But secondly, as you know, there are unconventional policies. And there's a review of some of the policies which are considered very good particularly in UK, USA and Europe. And right. these three are important economies for the global economy. And thinking about economics or economic policies, they are being reviewed. The, only, the main purpose of this book is to say that there is a lot of new thinking going on, there are a lot of new policies coming up, and the global economy after it reaches the normal will be new normal. What sort of a subject of reforms to review will you envisage here? It's not a question of my envisaging, but the question is, let us take financial sector. Mm. It was agreed during the reform agenda that there should be more deregulation. Excessive regulation is bad. Correct. Right. Now, what happened in the USA and UK? There was excessive deregulation. That's right. So they want to roll back. They're paying a price for it. Yes. Therefore, they are rolling back. Therefore, they are re-regulating. Reform, financial sector reform there means reduce the deregulation. Right. The financial sector reform in India means increase the deregulation. But they, they went too much ahead. So now we should know where to stop. Where to stop is not what we thought is the destination. The destination should be shorter. And that has to be redefined. Are we redefining that? But sir, do you think those lessons have been learnt across the world? Because many people still believe that what the world saw, and your book does talk about global crisis, and I am going to touch upon how financial crisis became economic, economic bordered on social, social now borders on political. I'm going to touch upon that. But do you think the world has learned its lessons? No, I think there is very, there is a lot of intense debate going on. Mm. It is, the debate is going on among the economists. And as you know, the type of political debates, political movements are a, really a reflection. And imagine the social upheaval that is happening in the Euro, Eurozone. Imagine the whole, con there are two things that are happening. In the whole of Eurozone, it was assumed that e e economic integration, EU integration, will be very successful if you have fiscal rules. Right. What happened? If the financial sector is under crisis, hmm. then it will have an impact on fisc. You have got countries where there was no fiscal problem, the financial sector problem became fisc. Right. What happened uh, in countries where there was no fiscal or financial crisis, but it became a crisis because there was in some other countries. Mm. Three, now after the crisis, they, they now realize that there should be more of fiscal union, but they are also saying banking union, which means they are so closely related to each other. That's right. And whether Britain should continue in uh, EU or not, if there is a greater, uh, greater integration. Mm. Now, if these are not manifestations of a political turmoil, a result of realization of how and why a crisis happens and how you get out of it. These are structural changes that are happening, reflection of the new economic realities. I, I'm glad you touched upon reflections of new economic reality because your book does allude to how the world is meandering from one economic crisis onto another. The financial crisis perpetuated into an economic crisis, the economic into a social, social into political. I think the I think the worry or the concern around the globe is if you look at the United States, if you look at Europe, if you look at even countries like India, whether politicians can resolve these problems or will they kick the can to the next generation? Uh, I, I think that's the big concern. Do you agree with me? Not, uh, let me put it this way. Because every economic problem today has to be resolved by politicians, whether it's the U.S. fiscal cliff or the debt ceiling in the United States. Uh, 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 drawing from Winston Churchill, right. as you know, he said that democracy is the worst form of government, except that there is nothing better than that. Mm, that's right. So ultimately, very important, complex decisions regarding the society have to be taken by the political leadership, because they are finally accountable. In some senses, that is the problem. Let me give an illustration of the problem that the global economy is facing. Which is the global money? Which is the global money? US dollar? That's right. That's a reserve currency. Mm. That's a currency in which trade happens. That's a currency in almost everything exactly. happens. Exactly. It's exactly like 
a national currency for a country, mm. a global currency is US. Mm. And who controls the quantity of global currency? The US Fed. Federal Reserve. That's right. Okay. The law. Right. What does it say about monetary policy of US Federal Reserve? Mm. It says US Federal Reserve should cater to the interests of United States of America. That's right. How do they worry about what's happening to the world? They may worry if they are going to affect them. That's right. Otherwise, legally they are not permitted to worry. And now that is governing the global economy. So if you say that politic politician is determining and therefore they are not able to solve the problem, I would say US Federal Reserve is determining the monetary policy. For, for banks around the world? Yes. That, so my point is the idea that only politicians are able to decide everything is not entirely right. Right. Unless US government changes the law and says that US Federal Reserve will take into account global circumstances. But sir, this is a very vicious cycle because the US Fed will never do anything that doesn't serve its own purpose or doesn't serve the purpose of the United States. So we are living in a time, uh, we are living in times when we are almost hostage. The world economy is hostage to what Ben Bernanke decides to do. That's exactly the point what I was trying to say, that the global financial architecture is still has a lot of distortions. Global monetary system and global financial architecture has a lot of distortion. If I ask you for a prescription for the Indian markets and in the Indian financial world, uh, you're right, the, the pivot of the world is shifting to Asia, the pivot of the world is shifting to emerging markets uh, like India. What should our reform agenda be? No, I don't want to be prescriptive because in, as I explained... Your book does talk about that. In <coughs> no, the main, the main point I'm trying to say is that many aspects of the reform, mm. which were originally de uh, defined, are still valid. You must have better education, That's you right. must have better public health, you must have better sanitation, you have to improve the quality of education, you have to have infrastructure. On that there is no issue. Mm. But there are some aspects on which, like fiscal management, external sector management, financial sector, export competitive risk, exchange rate, and the, and the amount of risk that a country like India can take in the context of the global uncertainties, continuing global uncertainties. So therefore, all I am saying is that all aspects of the reform should be reviewed, particularly in the context of the 12th fire plan. I'm, I'm glad you made a reference to external trade and that brings me to my question. You, your book also talks in detail about the current account deficit. Uh, just looking at the present scenario, how much of a concern is 5.4% current account deficit that India faces and does this really restrict the elbow room for monetary policy? See, uh, I'll be analytical on that. I don't want to be contextual. Sure. See, we have got two benchmarks in the Indian context. One is Rangarajan Committee. At that point of time, it was indicated that 2% current account deficit is sustainable. Is 5.4% alarming according to you? No, no, no. Let me go back sure. to analysis. I sure. don't want to refer to current number. I, I don't want to refer to current situation. Mm. If you look at it, in India, 93, uh, Rangarajan Committee and Balance of Payments, of which I was the member secretary, mm. at that time itself, unlike in other countries, we said 2% current account deficit is sustainable. Mm. Subsequently, we became more efficient. We became more resilient, global economy became more generally more favorable right. and people felt that 2.53 will be good. I think 12th fire plan also makes an assumption of 2.5 mm. as something as an average is good enough. So that is the numbers we have been talking. Then in the context of G20, there was a discussion, what is sustainable current account deficit right. in order to avoid global imbalances. Mm. There the number is suggested was 4%. They said for the medium term 4% is current account enough. surplus or current uh, surplus or deficit mm. is desirable. But that was not accepted. But that was the number which was talked about. It was opposed by USA, India, some other countries supported right. it. That's okay. So these are the numbers. Globally, it was talked of 4. In India, 2 was talked of, higher was talked. But everybody was talking of this more as, a, uh, as an average right. rather right. than a ceiling. So whenever you look at a particular year, and third fact, the fact is that when India grew fairly fast, the current account deficit was only 0.3%. That's right, yes. So basically the lesson is that the, the numbers generally talked of 2 or 4 on average, if in a particular year, if it is higher, what you have to see is whether that was because of cyclical conditions. If it is because of cyclical conditions, there is not a worry. But if there are underlying conditions, 
which make it likely to be on the higher zone yes. with reference to these two numbers. Right. Then you have to have a look at it. So first issue is how much is cyclical, how much is structure. But sir, given that premise, we should have a reason to worry. Because no. this is a cyclical... It depends on identification of the cyclical component of that number. Whatever number you have in a particular year, so in a particular year it can be a little more, in a particular year it can be a little less. Right. So the number 4 which was talked of in the G20, which was talked but not accepted, right. was medium term, for hmm. sus a, a longer period. So if 5.4 is for one year, 6 is one year, next year it comes down to 2, 3, no problem. Current account deficit, I know you don't want to comment specifically on, on the present context, but high current account deficit, high inflation. I'm not talking about the RBI, but any central bank has very little elbow room then, because these are two persistent problems. See, uh, there are several factors, but let me explain, let, let me, uh, I think what you're driving at is, uh, what you're driving it as I see it, right. uh, very cleverly, <laughs> no, <I'm not. laughs> is that, that the elbow room for monetary policy uh, is not confined to a debate on growth versus inflation. Right, exactly. I'm, not, I'm glad. That's very perceptive. I'm being sure. very honest. It's yes. very perceptive. Because even if you see the debate, they always think it's for growth versus inflation. No. You're right. The interest rate, the exchange rate, the current account deficit, the fiscal deficit. These are all important constituents. All important. Hmm. Both quantitatively and qualitatively. Both That's quantitatively right. and qualitatively. Hmm. You're absolutely right. So the question is the monetary authority will get uh, uh, headroom if the fiscal, there is fiscal space, mm. if there is fiscal space, monetary authority can take more risks. Mm. If there is no fiscal space, uh, policy space, monetary authority will have less capacity to take risks. Even financial sector regulator can take more risks or less risks, because ultimately the risk bearer is the fiscal. I'm going to try my luck here. Do you think there is enough fiscal measures that have been taken for our central bank to take some risk? No, I think basically, uh, uh, the contextually, I recognize that both the finance minister and the governor are absolutely on the same wavelength, in my view. Hmm. I think both of them have agreed openly, publicly, right. that FISC has to be managed. That's right. And there has the, to be consolidation. There has to be consolidation and uh, improved qualitatively also. That is, you know, qualitatively in the sense more of investment demand. Hmm. So I think both, uh, both uh, the finance minister and the governor have clearly indicated fiscal consolidation is needed, fiscal uh, consolidation is taking place, and it's necessary for uh, inflation control. Monetary authority also says fiscal consolidation is important to get greater headroom and to control inflation. Now the issue is the, ush, that the, the issue is forward-looking. Forward-looking, the monetary authority wants to say a always monetary policy takes effect with the lag. It's a right. lag effect. Exactly. So to the extent there is a lag effect, I want to be sure how far the fiscal consolidation will take place. So it's a matter of judgment also. It's not only a matter of statement, sure. it's a matter of judgment. Sure. And how the quality will go. And at the same time, he has also assessed the impact of the previous monetary policy measures. In doing so, as you rightly said, it's a current account difference. Monetary policy has a limited headroom in taming inflation and in boosting growth. Uh, there has to be, like you said, there has to be the same wavelength between monetary and fiscal policy. There have to be other actions that the government has to get in place. Do you agree with that assessment? L that monetary me. policy's role in taming inflation and boosting growth is limited at the end of the day? No, not at the end of the day. It is limited as long as there is fiscal dominance. Not at the end of the day. It should not be. For an ideal condition, you should avoid fiscal dominance. Fiscal activism is different from fiscal dominance. Fiscal activism is you can have a lot of fiscal activity, high revenue, high expenditure. Right. But if the fiscal activity is inefficient and draws too much mm. of the savings right. of the economy, national economy, mm. or foreign savings, then the, since that dominates the interest rate regime, whatever you call it, and it dominates the exchange rate and the aggregate demand, mm. the monetary authority necessarily has to reduce the freedom. Its, its, its freedom is reduced because they have to take care of stability. Is that so in other words, let me put it this way. Mm. If, if the fisc draws too much from the economy, private sector has to be constrained. Mm. Now, fisc is not sensitive to interest rate. 
right. If the government bar wants to borrow X, they borrow X. They'll borrow it, yes. But you want to reduce the demand. So what does the monetary authority do? I'm oversimplifying. What does the monetary authority do? You have to restrict the demand. These fellows are not uh, there for you restrict the private sector demand. And how do you restrict the private sector demand? You increase the interest rate. I want to go back to your book, but I have a candid question to ask you, and I will urge you to answer this question. You've been hawkish. You've been a hawk and a dove at the same time in the RBI through your years at the central bank. Do you think the time is now right for a easing monetary policy? Pardon? For a ease in monetary policy? Ease. Ease. You don't know, you see, it's, uh, it's, it's not a question of that. The, the whole idea is ease or tight. It's a very loose description of the complex realities. But everywhere, you know, for instance, as you rightly said, why are we accusing USA of uh, ease, 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 loose, monetary, loose policy. monetary policy being wrong? In fact, remember, the crisis was caused by loose monetary policy. What should have been the cure? Not tight monetary policy, one would be loose. It is strange, isn't it? So it's not this or that because that has changed. So therefore, whether easy or not is not the issue. What is appropriate? What is appropriate? So what is appropriate now? Well, I think, as I see it, in terms of diagnosis, fundamentals, I find exactly similar. You just read the midterm economic review of a few weeks back right. and today Governor Subara's statement, you don't find any difference in the diagnosis. Is there more optimism now though? It, it's less of pessimism. There's less of pessimism and on both counts, there's less of pessimism. And I think, uh, uh, so what I'm saying is that even with the same facts, even with the same situation, there's so much of judgment involved about the future and about the reactions of the markets, about the elasticities of supply, demand, investment demand, customer, consumer demand, that, uh, that uh, g the, given the challenges now, there is very little headroom for what I may call adventuring. Your book refers a lot to trust in banking that has been eroded around the world. Uh, what are the lessons that you think emerging markets like India need to learn from this? We are here opening up our banking system. We are talking about new banking licenses. Uh, what are some of the points that you would want to talk about at this stage and the book reference? Yeah, but to? I think as I try to explain clearly in the book, apart from analytics, right. uh, fortunately in countries like India and China, there is not yes. erosion of trust. Yes. Why? That's another important thing. I think basically what turns out, I would say, is that banks are special, mm -hmm. banks are important, banks inevitably will have to be supported by the government. Right. You can't leave them too much to the market. On their own. Second, banks are different from non-banks mm. and banks accept deposits. They provide important services. It is like a utility, mm. it is not a business. It has to be either publicly owned or intensely regulated. We have to, in order to keep the trust, the government should make sure that they are in, not indulging in speculative activities with the depositors' money. Right, right. Which means the exposure to financial markets, exposure to uh, 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 exotic instruments should be restricted. And that is the reform that they are talking of in the last. They call it Volcker rule, some people call it Wicker rule. All that is trying to say banks are special, the depositors' money is special, please take care of it, don't allow access. Oh. And those are the lessons which simply mean, in right. my view, oh. that the financial sector should be reformed, but not reformed exactly committing the same mistakes that other countries did. Hold back, hmm. rethink, and go into what they are trying to do now. Don't walk that extra mile and try to step yes, back is I think yes. what your book really refers to. I was reading that part. I, I have two questions on the Indian banking space, sir, and you're somebody who's really closely watched it. The rising level of NPAs has been a big cause of concern. Uh, it is, of course, a reflection of what happens in economic activity. Uh, and the second is that India is on the verge of giving out new banking licenses. The debate is still on there whether corporates with Western interests should get those licenses or not. You were talking about safe banks and how banks are very, very special. Uh, how do you see this argument? What should the RBI be looking at? Uh, the, the second question is of the banks. Yes. The first was? About NPAs. So, uh, there, of course, uh, there, is, uh, there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, the banks, by and large, are well capitalized. So, in a way, there's no immediate problem and uh, they have a reasonable cushion of the capital. 
but that's a problem which has to be addressed. So I, don't, I wouldn't consider it as a serious problem about the resilience of the banking sector, but that's a problem which has to be handled. But there is a sub-problem. Mm. The sub-problem is the corporates are highly leveraged. Highly? Leveraged in India. Yes. By global standards. Mm. Remember that. Right. Well, the financial sector is strong. Corporates actually in India. In other countries, corporates are pretty strong, cash flow. They are less leveraged. That's right. In India, the corporates are highly leveraged. Mm. And that's a... In fact, that's more of a danger signal. Second, the corporates have large foreign currency exposure. Mm. They are not only leveraged in domestic currency, but they are know. leveraged and they have currency mismatch. Their cash flow is in rupees. Mm. Their liability is in that. So they are more vulnerable to exchange rate uh, changes. So these lender variability, uh, they re these make uh, 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 their implications for banks. If their are you, are you a little concerned how easy it is to restructure a corporate loan these days? I mean, everybody. Yeah, but then once you restructure, whatever yeah. the accounting standards, it means that the quality exactly. of that is the so, asset is bad. So therefore, I, I'm saying that it's not so much the number, yeah. but you have to go back and look deeper. So right. that is the other uh, other. Sure. Uh, on the banking license, I think one has to again learn from global experience that already there is a problem with large financial conglomerates. So if there's a large problem, large financial conglomerate, if you have a large conglomerate in both industrial and financial, mm. so we have to see what will be the problems and what are the b possible benefits. And uh, I think uh, the, these are, there are a number of lessons uh, and we should learn global lessons. And apart from India's own past lessons, and then take a concern. Do you agree with the argument that corporates can, should not be given banking licenses? Now they said, these are not uh, on which you can make a pronouncement. Mm. But I think you have to assess the risks and the benefits. Your book also talks about role of corporates and their governance. Uh, it talks about pre-crisis, it talks about crisis and the whole uh, resolution. Uh, would you want to touch and elaborate upon that point in your book? No, but basically the, the point I was trying to make is particularly the governance and financial sector. Right. Particularly the financial sector. Mm. It's very clear that there has been a failure of governance. And as you can see, even the largest financial conglomerates have been just not telling the truth. That's right. To the regulator. If that is not a failure of governance, what is it? Mm. At the highest level. And not one. One after another. The biggest boys on Wall Street are the biggest liars, they say. No, I'm not saying it. You are saying it. <laughs> but I said it more in terms of governance should be improved. So I think let, let there be a little more of truth in mm. future. Uh, I, I want to go back to inflation, sir, because that's something you understand. This is my last question. Uh, I, I just want to come back to the supply side constraints on inflation. Uh, do you think while the debate is very much on there that inflation has been high, uh, you know, there have been high interest rates, uh, the, gov the government hasn't perhaps done enough, it's now beginning to... Uh, but do you agree with me when I say it is the supply side constraints that will take care of high prices and monetary policy, again, will have limited impact? There is, no, there's a slight difference. Right. If you don't take care of supply side, hmm. it constrains monetary policy. It restricts the elbow room. Yes. If there are supply elasticities, hmm. if there are supply elasticities and if there are supply efficiencies, then Reserve Bank can, can confidently reduce the interest rates. Because with the supply will be elastic, the investment will respond, productivity will increase. That confidence will be lacking. Even exchange rate. If there is a confidence that uh, quality of growth will be high, it will be competitive, then you take and take a bet on it. So therefore, in fact, the, the fact that the supply side, both in terms of efficiency and response, these are a big question. That's not being debated enough. Yes, I agree. I haven't... Uh, I only touched on it, I know. but I would say that is a central question. I'm not asking my last question to the former governor of the RBI. I'm asking the author of uh, New Thinking, Y.B. Reddy here. Are you a more confident economist in the last four months about India than you were four months back? Actually, uh, I would say I am better informed economist since I started writing the book. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You. It's a pleasure.